this is, this is, this is. This is Brad, dude. I'm, I'm, I'm super pumped that you made time to do this, bro. Abs- you're on my podcast. Thanks for taking the time to do my podcast. I appreciate it. I mean, it just, it's, uh, it's, it's just funny how long we've known each other, but how long we haven't talked. But it just, it's, it's a very, um, you know, you just got some relationships that you're just like, you know, just because of that time, you know, um, it just, it's just crazy. And just from that time forward, it's weird to know people, but then to become even bigger fans, like from an artistic standpoint, you know, so it's really weird. And then you're like older and one day and you got kids and you're married. And then like, I'm watching you on fixer upper and I'm like, he just won. <laughs> he just won the world. Like I was like, as if they couldn't do more then you just show up on Fixer Upper like it's no big deal. Because to me, I would argue that was the last TV show. Mm. Okay. Like, I've I, got I want to hear your theory, that, yeah. Well, no, no, because when you think about it, um, someone used the term appointment TV, and I was like, ooh, that's heavy. You know, appointment TV. Mm-hmm. And just because I think way too much about this stuff, I was like, I think Fixer Upper was the last television show. Like, it was the last show that people waited for a new episode at, like, Thursday night, whatever time it was on HGTV. And it's weird that it would be on HGTV, which is, I know they're all conglomerates, but in one sense, it was the kind of punk rock of, like, networks, right? It was it was just punk rock that we're going to just have shows walking through houses and selling houses and all you know and then chip and joanna show up and to me it was like it was very punk rock that they just sort of showed up they were like the big band that went to an indie label and they leveraged all the indie level distribution but they were a massive band yeah it's and yeah and that was I show people were like, oh, Thursday, we have to turn the... That's gone. Absolutely gone. It's so weird, too, to like... Like, I was... Uh, we are in Orange County doing a show, and we were at the hotel at night, and there's all these... This hockey team, like a hockey team from New Jersey, and we were out on the patio, like, drink, having some drinks, and... <clears throat> and then all of a sudden, I'm walking through the, through the area, and all these moms start going wait, you're familiar. You're the guy from fixer up or blah, 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 blah. I'm like the guy from fixer. Yeah, sure. I was on one episode, but, but okay. (laughs) Yeah. And they all started just chatting me up. New Jersey uh, hockey moms, not soccer hockey. And, uh, they were super nice and just wanted to know all about it. And so I had to, it's like, it forces me to be somebody that I'm not for a second. Like I'm not Mike from MXPX. I'm Mike from fixer upper the dude. Right. (laughs) Yeah, and I kept, and I think people were like watching the episode, like, and I'm sure you've gotten this a lot because, again, that was, I mean, when we think about where Magnolia is now, right, as far as a cultural, just icon brand business, I mean, it's a movement. I mean, um, but you were kind of like, it's almost like you were one of the bands like opening up with that band, right? It's like you were there. And then all of a sudden, I mean, you must have got hit up from people. I mean, by people when that came out, right? Because oh, that everybody. was like the last <laughs> of millions of people watching TV at the same time. Yeah. I mean, so I mean, your 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 phone must have went off. Absolutely. It still goes off. Every now and again, I'll get a text from somebody like, I'm watching you on Fixer. Like, they didn't know. Like, they've missed the memo for like three years. Four. Now it's like four years, but... Maybe it's five years by now. No, I don't even know. I don't remember anymore. I think it was 2018 when it happened. So four years. Did and, you know? And l- unless everyone's talked about this before on your podcast, but I'm just saying, but like, did you know what was going on? What do you mean? Like, did I know how was, big like, Fixer Upper was, or yeah, that that it was becoming this thing? Yeah, I mean, it was. We were on the very last episode of the series of the season of the ser- season and series. Uh, Fixer Upper, uh, as it was on HGTV, because they've come back recently with uh, their new version of it or whatever. But yeah, we were the very last one, and my wife was into it, and she would kind of like rope me into watching now and again. And and 
like you said, you know, punk rockers can kind of get into shows like that because you're like, yeah, I want to do that to my house or my truck or whatever yeah. it is that you're watching, right? Um, it's, the, it's the original DIY. I yeah, mean, exactly. So, so we got into it. I knew it was big. I figured, yeah, she okay. She, one day, she, I walked in and she goes, "Yeah, I signed us up for Fixer Upper, and so if we get on the show, we're gonna." buy a house in Texas. And I'm like, okay, sure, sure. No problem. <laughs> what? Wait a minute. You weren't in Texas? What's that? that no, we were in you, Washington you were... state. No way. Yeah. Yeah. So most people on the show, the show, you know, TV, right? We could talk all sorts of different aspects of yeah. TV, but TV is pretty much the producers and creators of TV shows want to have some they want to have some idea of what's what's going to happen, right? Uh, they want to be able to predict the outcome of their TV show, you know, so that it goes in the direction they want. So a lot of these people on Fixer Upper type shows, um, they're just local. They've already got a house. So it's not quite as real, right? And, and so when we came up, we were like, we didn't have a house. We're like, we need a house. We need to do all this stuff. And we, we were thinking this is a legit thing. And it is, it is legit. They actually do build your thing. But a lot yeah. of the people on the show have been friends of friends, friends of the family, sure. yeah. employees, people that they like find, Oh, they want to do a pro. Okay. Let's do their project, that kind of thing. And so we came in completely separated from all of that. And the only reason we got in was because they had had one of their main, uh, main families drop out like they were supposed to be moving you know to Waco for this or that and they're they didn't get the job and so it was like we're screwed we need somebody and instead of looking at the list of thousands and thousands of contestants um we had just we were flying back from Houston uh to Washington State Seattle uh it was during the holidays and and my wife's family lives in Texas so we were in Texas for the holidays anyway I sent a tweet because my wife was like hey help me out so send, send Chip a tweet, and here's the picture. And it was a picture of my kids with a sign that says, Texas or bust. And I just wrote to, to Chip, hey, we're ready to move these babies to Texas. Pick us. Put us on your show. You know, something like that. And a day later, as we're in the airport in Houston, I was actually in the bathroom. <laughs> and I come out. I'm like, holding the phone up to to my wife going look at this look at this and chip tweeted back how can we say to no how can we say no to those beautiful faces and so we're just like i guess we're on the show now and i guess i have to buy a house in texas what <laughs> dude wait so no wait so no like mxpx no like we n nothing no but I, I assume they looked up who we were and did some like, you know, Googling, some uh, Facebook sleuthing as people do, you know, ch check some yeah. Facebook. So I'm sure that that was done. And then we had to do, we had to do like a, an interview, like on video, like we're doing right now. We had to like talk to a casting director just to make sure yeah. that kind of get the story. Like, are you serious? And then the, the, the director guy that was actually shooting, Michael Mat Matsumoto, we ended up being, uh, becoming friends with him and his family. Uh, through the process, but he texted me on DM on Instagram and was like, are you serious? You really want to do this? And I was like, why are they asking me this? Like, cause I'm sure yeah. a lot of people say just pick us and then aren't really, Oh no, right, no yeah. I'm not buying a house in Texas, but here we are. I'm in Texas right now. And, uh, so was, was there, but was there, what was there something like, Hey, we want to get out of Washington and do something new and, and yeah. get to work. Our story was, well, it is, I mean, it's not, a, it is our story, I guess, but uh, my wife and I had always talked about someday it would be great to have a house in Texas because uh, my wife's from Texas. She's got family in Texas. I have a love of Texas uh, from my project Tumble Down that I, that I do yeah. sometimes or have done. Uh, we played in Texas all the time. And so it just, I don't know, there was like a, a weird bond it was like our my sister state in a way, you know, where I grew up and born and raised in Washington State. Uh, my sister state is is Texas. 
And now I live on the Washington Idaho border. Yeah, so you're living in Moscow, huh? I'm like I'm like so like I've like I'm like a Cougs fan now. Like I'm like right here. Like I'm like you know I had to leave everything Southern California because we moved like we moved moved eight years ago and it was like we're planted here. You know what I mean? Like we're planted here and it was like you know I'm you know so and Idaho doesn't really have like a sports team per se. So it's right. like you just you just everything Washington. Well, what led so, you to Moscow? How did you get there? You know, I had done, um, I had written, I was, I, I wanted to do, um, at some point in the midst of music videos and documentaries and some movies and different things, I was like, I really want to do a kid's film and just something fun. And where I lived in Thousand Oaks, um, in Cali, um, it was just, just one of those weird things. Like, um, I mean, it's, it's such an out of context story, but it's so I'm in my office in California and Kirk Cameron walks into my office one day and he's like, Hey, I'm Kirk. You know? And I'm like, Hey, you know, <laughs> I was just, and I'd seen him around town. Cause we, I mean, he lives in the same area, but I would see him, at, you know, I was, I don't, you know, I'm not going to be that guy. I think I waved at him once, you know? Um, and where's your friend boner? Yeah. Exactly. No, it's like, what was I going to do? <laughs> no, but, but it was funny though because I always liked him. I was like, always, and I remember, I remember like, it wasn't too long before that that I had seen like a YouTube video of him like street witnessing in Venice and all these like Mexican cholo gangsters like surround him. Okay. And you can you can still just Google it and find it. It's gnarly, and he's just in the middle of these gangbangers just like like a rock just talking and they're like in his face and the dude didn't break so i always i always kind of been like you know there's something there's something kind of punk rock about that dude like it's easy to kind of just go oh kirk cameron and left behind movies and child star but he there was a little bit of grit you know and if it's one thing i can spot it's a little bit of grit and i was like he's got a little grit you know and um then he just walks into my office and he had seen a movie I had done called Collision um, with Christopher Hitchens and Douglas Wilson, this documentary I made. And he was a fan of it. He said, hey, I'm working on a documentary and um, I'd like to see if you could help me with it. And he gave me the rough cut, gave me a hard drive. I watched it. I thought it was great. I, I don't know what you want me to do. And he's like, well, I kind of want you to reshoot the whole thing. And I was like, I don't know, this is, this is a great doc. And he's like, no, nah, I wanted to have balls like your movie did. And I was like, oh. And so we'd end up, you know, helped him finish this project. Um, but for legal reasons, like, I just, I redid the whole movie. I didn't put my name on it. I put my name on as, like, craft service. Because I didn't want him to have to go through, like, writers and directors and all that stuff. Because he, he had done this really huge production. Um, and it was really successful. And then sometime after that, I was like, let's let's make like a kid's baseball movie. And I knew about this writer named N.D. Wilson, who was like this, you know, New York, you know, Times best-selling children's author and reached out to him to see if he would write it. And he lives here in Moscow, Idaho, flew up to Moscow, Idaho, met with Nate. But while I was meeting with him, I just kind of fell in love with this little weird town called Moscow, Idaho. Um, it's just, I like, it's a kind of punk rock town. You got like super, super, you know, hold the line conservative Christians. And it's the only liberal county in Idaho. Mm. Just this. There's the, I just, I love the tension. I love that it's just kind of tense. Like yeah. you've got like full on liberals, like walking in like naked into like Christians, like coffee shops. Like, you know, you're going to kick us out, you know, like, like it's that tense. There's a culture like war going on down there, huh? Wild. And I just, I just, you know me, I just like, to me, I just want to be around the pit of life. I like where it's just, I really do love, like, I, I, I don't know if I ever thought I was that punk rock until like the last couple of years. I was like, oh, like, cause I always thought all, all my heroes were, were really punk rock, you know, and you guys being one of them. And and I just, you know, then I realized, oh, actually, I am punk rock. Like, if you're punk rock, there's just, you, you don't, you don't, you just don't ever, you don't ever leave it. And I just think 
that for so long around film and video and projects, what I never realized until actually about like three and a half, four years ago, especially when I realized that I wanted to go all in on social media, I was like, wait a minute, you can get in the van now on this device and go play a show every single minute of the day. And you guys were always like my inspiration. Bands like you, but because I was pretty young when I started. I started at 18, 17, 18, didn't go to college, started making music videos. So I was looking at bands like you and you guys and going, how are they doing this? Okay, they're making their own music. They're making their own recordings. They get in the van and they play a VFW hall or they play this. Or like The idea of like you play every show you get. Like the greats, like you don't turn down anything when you start. And so I was mm -hmm. like, I'm going to start my entire career oh like i'm just gonna restart it but as like a band and i just started using social media i started doing every single thing that bands did that i was always aware of but it was like you can't do that as like a regular person or just a filmmaker i was like what do you mean like when you're a band you make music you promote yourself you talk about yourself you do photo shoots of yourself like multiple photo shoots so you have multiple looks throughout the year and i was like and i loved all that stuff and i was like i'm just gonna do that for myself yeah like, i'm gonna make album covers every day of me like i'm the brand like yeah and everyone's like oh that's so self-centered and that's it, what are you talking about like if you've ever had to promote anything or back to guys like you I watched you guys do a million horrible radio interviews with the most stupid people on the planet. And so people now are like, oh, I'm not going to promote myself on TikTok. That's stupid. I'm like, you should go on a tour and do radio shows. Like, if you want to see what it's like to really do stupid stuff, <laughs> like, just because someone's paying for it and they put you in a van that you got to pay for, like, it's no more glamorous and the idea now that you can be as stupid as you want or as serious as you want every day on all these platforms. For me, I saw it as this new, as the new punk rock. I was like, this is the new punk rock. What we're doing right here, like this is, like we're doing a show. Like I'm on you, like I'm opening up for you on your show with your <laughs> audience. That's rad, like that. So that's how I started looking at all this stuff and that's somehow not how I got to Moscow, Idaho, but that's but, where I'm doing all this. I was from Moscow. Yeah, but uh, that's interesting because you were way ahead of your time, and and it's well for those that don't, people probably know if they're listening, you directed like six videos for us early on. Yeah, uh, three three videos for Teenage Politics, three videos for our Life in General album, so our second yeah. album and our third album, and at the time we were just kids, and we lo yeah. I looked at you as okay, this guy's got it going on. He knows what he's doing. Like you had their whole crew, which you did. So I'm not saying yeah. I was wrong about that, yeah. but, but yeah. <laughs> the, the, the way we perceive things as, as young people, even yeah. as adults, I guess. But, um, I just remember back to that time and just everything was going by so fast. I didn't even realize people like you were even looking at us and going, Oh yeah, they're doing this, 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 or whatever. Like, those thoughts were never in my head. So like, I feel like you have a much better grasp of the situation than I ever did mm -hmm. back then. Yeah. You should have been our yeah. manager. I mean, <laughs> I think I tried at one point, like I, all, all bands, I was like, I want to, which I learned that's a real job. And that's, yeah, a, that's a, yeah, that, that is a terrible a, job. <laughs> yeah. um, but I remember, you know, I've told the story just because lately, uh, dude, I was, I got invited to speak at a conference like four years ago and I did my whole shtick and it was all kind of polished and nice and um, talking about just the big, you know, the campaigns and the Toyota and mm -hmm. blah, 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 Yamaha guitar campaigns. I was, it was a very high end type talk, you know, and I happened to just mention in there somehow super tones mxpx like came out of my mouth and it just it wasn't planned and afterwards i had all these people show up and they were like in tears they said what mxpx videos did you do and i was like well, I and they were like in tears like 
that means so much to us. And then they're pulling their sleeves up and they're tatted, you know, and they're like, and, and I was like, ah, this is, I was like, man, like it hadn't really hit, like it hadn't really hit me, even though I've always formulated my own opinions about all the bands I've worked with and followed. But, but that was like, and it sort of got me going back and just getting caught up with everything. And the last couple of years, so I, I, I was talking a lot about you guys. And when I kickstarted my brand and my, who I was doing on social media, I think like week two or three, I posted a clip of doing time. Dude, to my phone, do people were just calling people I'd known for 10, 15, 20 years were like, I never knew you worked with MXPX. And I, and like, and I'm sure you, I mean, you, you understand it. I think I understand it now that I've, articulated who I am in the last few years, you don't mm -hmm. really understand how many people you touch. You just don't. Um, but the story that kept coming up that, that I was telling people was I, cause at that time I'm doing Pennywise and Guttermouth and Blink 182 and all that's happening. And when I, I remember I was somewhere in Hollywood one night and it was like two in the morning and someone said to me, hey, um, do you want to do a music video for these like little punk kids up in Washington? And I was like, I, mean, I took every gig. I was like, yeah, that, that's that, you know, he's like, because, you know, this label is having a hard time, you know, MTV won't take them seriously. And maybe if you did a video, like they could at least say, hey, the guy that's doing Blink and the guy that's doing whatever and. I was like, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm down. And so we ended up doing, I actually ended up doing Mike Knott first. And I think, I forget what else happened before MXPX, but then we do punk rock show and mm. punk rock show. And you know, yep. Go ahead. Well, yeah, we, yeah, we do. I mean, I thought we did punk rock. That show was the first first. one. Yeah. Because, well, I'll give you a little context. We, it's funny because we, things were different back then. You know, we were kind of playing catch up. We had our first album out, Poking at You, in 1994 or five, something like that. And we graduated in 95. So it came out in 94. We didn't do a video for it until we graduated. And the day after, another guy, Who directed that? Ron, Who was it? his name was Ron. Uh, yes. Uh, oh, man, I, I should have been prepared on this. But he, he did want to add the day after we graduated. Yeah. And then we drove down to California and stayed at Tim Mann's house from Focused, and he had that Vespa, and we met up with you the next day and right. shot, shot Punk Rock Show in the L.A. River. Yep. And then just around there or something. Back in those days, you kind of just like, let's get together and just shoot cool yeah. scenes. No, and, and I remember thinking, because I, I was still doing, you know, 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter, but I was like, oh, we, we should shoot Super 8, which mm -hmm. is funny because Ron shot Super yes, 8. So yes, like, I. <laughs> The first, like, I thought I was being like really creative, and I remember later when I saw Ron's video, I was like, "Oh, but it's kind of funny." I mean, Ron was a great kid. I remember talking to him, but it's sort of like, "Hey, there's a guitar in the room. How you're gonna play it's gonna be different. How I'm gonna play it, like, it's just." And I remember seeing two people film MXPX with a Super 8 camera. And they were different types of videos. And that was the first time that really ever clicked because it was, it was, it was such a close scientific experiment. But I remember, like, I remember when we started doing takes, I was, I was really, really shocked because I was like, because you were, what, 18? You Pro probably, 18? yeah, probably 18. Yeah, probably 18. But the thing that, like, really tripped me out was you seem like again we'll talk objectively about that mic for a second <laughs> yeah, okay? yeah i remember thinking like clearly holy moly this dude gets it like like you n not a lot of people you show up for a music video and they do their thing uh, i don't want to do those i don't want to lip sync i don't and you're like let's go and I was like, how does this kid, where do you get 
that, like, I get maybe wanting to be in a band. I get maybe wanting to be on stage. I get you know, even doing photos. You're looking cool. But a music video is a different type of beast. And you were just 110% committed. You knew what to do. And I was like, Boy, that is, this is, I, it was, it was freaky. And the story I tell people is I finished cutting the video and then like the next day I'm finishing a Pennywise video. And so we're in, that's when you went to edit bays and you spent 500 bucks an hour just to get the midnight shift, you know, of sure. an edit bay. <laughs> and Fletcher comes in. We finish his video, and I'm thinking, man, I, 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 I want to show him this video, but, like, is he just going to punch me? Like, why are you working with these little punk kids? Like, punk rock show? Like, they have an anthem? Like, who, who has the audacity to be in a punk band, to be kids, and sing a song called Punk Rock Show? Like, that's, like, the, the gall, right? Like, especially <laughs> from Fleck, the self-appointed you know, heir of all things punk rock. So he gets to decide, right? And I'm like, man, I'm just going to show it to him. I show him the video. He doesn't say a word. And it ends. And he's just sitting there. And we're all in this room. Ken Dario my, was my directing partner back then. Rick Pratt, the editor. A couple other people were there. And he's just, the screen is blank. And he's just looking at it. And I'm thinking, I'm like, this is getting weird. Because it had been like a minute had now passed. Is and he then he just sort of, he just kind of put his head down. And he goes, that might be the best punk song I've ever heard. And I was like, wait, wait, wait. Whoa. I was like, whoa. It was almost like, you know, you were, you sort of knew you had to, you know, a cute girlfriend, but you weren't sure what your friends were going to think. And then everyone, <laughs> she's dope. You're like, I know, I know she's dope. You know what I mean? Like, and it was like, and literally I think like a week later, I mean, I'm probably all jumbled on time, but it felt like a week or two later I'm with Blink and we're finishing one of their videos and I pop in punk rock show. I show Blink and Blink says the exact same thing. Like, dude, who's this band? That's like one of the best punk songs ever, which is funny because when I'm there showing Blank, and you'll be able to make whatever connections here, Elise from Dance Hall Crashers is in the room. Mm. And Elise goes, this band's amazing. Who are they? And I remember all that happening, and I just remember thinking like, how is it possible? Like, how are these three kids this good? Like, it was just, it was weird. I mean, I can't, that's just my perspective, what, what I'm watching through. I know you're, you've got a completely different lens, but I'm watching everybody kind of lose their mind. And I kid you not, I, the years after that, I was in more than one recording studios. I would. I walked in. I, sw I swear before the Lord. I walked in, and they had life in general, and they would turn life in general off. <laughs> I was like, "Well, are you guys playing life in general?" Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, "Dude, people, bands were lit were studying that album." I saw it like I saw what the cool kids were doing while the little funny punk band kids were supposedly just doing their thing. I was watching like the guard be really, really tripped out trying to fit, like they were trying to crack the code. Like I saw it like I saw it. So to me, it was always like, how is this the best punk band in the world? Like, I just, it was just weird that, because I knew you guys, hanging out with you guys, and it's like, no one's sitting around talking about how to conquer the world as the greatest punk band. Everyone's just doing their thing, having it, like, but it wasn't until, not wasn't until, but I remember when I got, when Brandon sent me Life in General, 
And um, and I don't know any lyrics. I mean, my favorite band's Iron Maiden. I still can't sing a lyric. I don't remember. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> That's okay. Um, <clears throat> but melody. But I hear melodies, and I think it's the first song on Life in General. I mean, it's I mean, middle it's just, name. Yeah. yeah. Right. But then the do na 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 na, and I was like, what? And I, at that moment, I was like dude, you can't, this band, oh, it's over. Like, that's the win. Like, when you sing that, whatever we call that in music, I don't know if it's a hook, it's a heart, I don't know what it is, but that. And then I think track number two, uh, I think then has like this, chunk chunks, has these like chunk chunks in there, like uh, like kind of break down into these chunk chunks that are like harder than like a sick of it all. Chunk chunk, and I was like, it's over. I was like, it's it's over. I was like, these guys, <laughs> these guys just won. And I just, I just loved everything about watching you guys from that point forward, because it really was for me watching like, okay, this is what it's going to really look like. And I remember drawing upon it these last few years to really be punk rock, to really be punk rock. You're not going to fit anywhere, but everybody's watching. You know, there's a few things you blew my mind on, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> one, I don't think I really did know what I was doing. I think I just got lucky in a few times like, oh, lip, lip sync. OK, I can do that or whatever. But that being said, it's awesome that we got so lucky. You know, it's better to be lucky than smart. Right. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> but when you talked about at least being in the room. And you said you're going to make some connections like that. Seriously, you probably are at least half the reason why we went anywhere we did after that. I mean, sure, maybe that song and that album and life in general, brought, you know, would have brought us other places any, anyway. But Elise brought us out on tour. Um, she got us on tour with like, I don't know if she got us on tour with Face to Face, but I think because because of our connections with Dancehall Crashers and and Elise and uh, we got so many tours and it happened so quickly. Everything was just and and like you said, you know, we never said no to a show or a tour or anything. Like, if you want to bring us, we're gonna go. And right. we just started going and going and going. And before we knew it, five years had passed. It's pretty insane. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, it, like I said, I like I said, it was it's it's crazy again. It's crazy to think about, and I think. Remember later, I think at some point, I don't know when it was, but I saw a picture of you guys doing like a hometown show in Bremerton. And I remember just seeing the pictures, a super crazy wide angle lens shot. And I was just like, you know, you're tatted even more. And it's just like, yeah, you know, I was just look, I was like, these, these dudes, these dudes did it. And I, I just respected so much. Cause you know, I remember all the noise back then. Like people don't really understand the noise back then. Like it's, it's gnarly to think of the different cultures and subcultures and scenes. And, you know, uh, you know, I can't, I can't fathom what you guys were going through. I mean, I remember I'd show up at shows sometimes just to want to go say hi. And I just see you guys just sitting somewhere in the back in a, in an alley, just away from people, just sitting there and it's just, <laughs> yeah, just sitting. I just like, Whoa, like, Maybe I'll just go watch the show. Like it just, it's just heavy. I think the sort of heaviness of what a band has to go through, which is really like, just a, it's just a microcosm of life. But it really mm -hmm. is such. It, there's so much pressure because life, you don't have the element of being somebody per se. You know, on any level of being somebody, it's just, it's just so, it's just so different. And so. You know, watching all that, and then I, and I remember that I remember when when we drove up to do. I remember on Life in General, the phone call was "Move to Bremerton's a hit." That was the phone call, right? And this is a great, <laughs> yeah, this is a great story because, of course, we're, we loaded up a van, drove twenty something hours from SoCal to you guys. I remember when we got there, and I think it was your house, um, mm -hmm. my parents' house, yeah. And, yeah, parents' house, and walked into the rehearsal space. I hadn't been there five, five or ten minutes. I saw the rehearsal space. I just said, "Let's do doing time." 
Yeah. I, yeah. I, that might be one of my, four, one of my all time favorite videos, by the way. My, my, mine too, which is weird. <laughs> like it's it's in my top three of like. Well, it's it's everything. It's funny. It's everything I ever. It's funny. Well, that weekend or ever whatever it was that those three days, to me is everything I, I've. I, that's my only playbook, a performance video, lifestyle, and then comedy. Like that's it. Mm -hmm. Like, and we did all three of those that week. But, I, but I remember let's do do in time. You walked in, wait, we're shooting 35 millimeter film. It was like, we did four, we did three takes. And then I rolled some slow motion of you guys jumping. Like it was four takes. Yeah. Right. That was it. And the, and the pressure was all about move to Bremerton, and we had a pretty long day on that. But remember, we were sitting in the house, we were done, and we just started talking about Chick Magnet. Like we were just yep. laughing and making up things, and 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 I don't know why this sticks in my head, but we talked about where could we go to shoot this, and I thought, I thought we talked about a a different place, like a pizza place that you had worked at. Oh yeah. Spiro's. Yep. 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 Because you were boasting like you made the best salad. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I still do. <laughs> That's the funniest thing. I, when I think of Mike Carrera, I'm like, yeah, the dude's got an ego. I'll tell you, dude, he talks about this salad he made. Like you, cause you were like, no, like you were serious about the salad. <laughs> So just like, no, it's all about the cheese. You got to put a lot of cheese on it. It's just funny, right? Yeah. But then we just, somehow we just said, let's go to that diner. Like there was no game plan. We just said, let's go to the diner and make something up. And that that's how Chick Magnet gets made. And everyone was thinking move to Bremerton. And so it's weird to think that like, well, not weird to think. I just think in the spirit of what you guys have been doing and to come around that energy into into I like making things the way bands, because that's always been my influence. All my friends were in bands. You get in a room and you and you just start jamming. Mm -hmm. Like that's it. And so to do that with the camera was like that was always the best thing. And I think what we did to do those three videos in three days, it's funny to think what we did in those three days. It's gnarly. Yeah. Can I say something about Doing time real quick, and then I want to come back to, to Chick Magnet. So doing time, one of the reasons why it is one of my favorite videos is because for me it personally, I mean, I look at that video and I see our practice space. And, and immediately I think about all the times we meet in there and practice and how, you know, I change up things now and again. I put an amp on the workbench you know, you get a big enough amp and then it can't fit on the workbench anymore and it's got to go down there. And just think things morphed and changed over the years. But it was always, you know, it was it was a garage, but it was always our space. We took over that space. My parents, they had no say. I mean, like, maybe they said something, but they didn't really, they didn't enforce anything. So just, it's like the hard work that we put into, the hours and hours we put into our music, hanging out with each other, doing that thing and then of course we'd like go outside and sit by the fire pit or whatever out in the yard but it's a very suburban looking you know backyard whole deal um so yeah that video just it every, i just think about it every time and i was thinking about it even before we were going to do the podcast i was just thinking about those times about the garage and now it's an office it's like our main office so it's it's what? Yeah, you know, where we do our mail order is is where our first studio was built. So over the years, we've had a studio in there. We've had, now it's merch and an office, and it was our our practice space. So it's it's uh, wow. it just keeps building. But uh, Chick Magnet, you know, that's a perfect way to describe kind of how what taught me how to make videos is is when we did Chick Magnet, and I remember we were we were all just kind of like coming up with ideas. All right, maybe. Maybe Yuri, I don't know whose idea it was for, for ex exactly, but like maybe Yuri's like a magician and he like does the, you know, we just had all these little vignettes written out. And I remembered, oh, that's a really smart way to like come up with, and you just choose the best ones and shoot them. And then if they make the video, cool. Um, yeah. And that's sort of like, I mean, it's kind of a genius way to work when you're in a punk band, when... I, I by trade, I don't necessarily think of myself as like a nine to five type job guy you know like 
I like just kind of winging it. I like being up against the wall. I like being pressured. Um, even though nobody really likes being pressured, when it comes right. down to it, it kind of helps me. It helps a lot of us. So yeah. that experience, uh, not only just the ideas, but the getting your friends. Like we had all our friends. We, we yeah. uh, a few of our Call best girlfriends. Friends. Yeah, we're starting. Call- yeah, can you? Can you, you want to be in a video? So our friend Dale that was in the cooties uh, is in it. Um, our roadie JJ is in it. So it's just like all our our friends from Every, Remember JJ? Everyone, <laughs> of course. They do. It was everybody. It's crazy. So yeah. So and, and that's kind of like – and that is a great sort of little microcosm. Like that's – at least at that point, that was MXPX's culture. That was our world. Those were like our friends. and. Yeah. I'm sure that there's a lot of band videos that do the same thing in their own way. Like their, their friends are in their videos. Yeah. And it's, and it really was like the, let me get this here. It, it really was the, it really was the spirit of how everyone, cause I saw everyone around you guys and like everyone was just having, I mean, everyone really just was having fun. Like it really was like, you know, I, I forget who, who even had access to that place. To that diner. We just went and talked to the yeah, the, the manager or owner, and nothing happens in Bremerton. So they're like, "Yeah, sure." <laughs> well, you remember Ken, right? Remember my directing partner Ken was with me. Yes, Dario. Um, I mean, now that you would keep up on that, but like Ken went on, like Ken created the like Despicable Me and the Minions, and like that's Ken. Yeah, that's insane. Like. The level of genius, like me having just Ken around, and I think Ken plays the, uh, he's the bartender guy in there. He's, he's, you know, he's doing, he's you know, he's serving the, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, it's fun to think of also, like, well, it's one thing to get together, but it's, it's even, re- it's even cooler when, like, your friends are really good at stuff. You know, I'm sure you look at your bandmates and think the same way. Like, it's, it's one thing to play. But when you get to look around for me to look at you guys or to look at Ken, look at people on the crew, you know, look at Yuri, who like didn't like didn't second guess anything. Like there was no insecurity at all. It was like, Yuri, OK, great. We threw the hair on his chest. It was just he just comes in and just starts doing his thing. And just like in no one there was never a moment of, hey, maybe we shouldn't do that. Or maybe we thought that was funny at the time. And now that we're overthinking it, it was just to me, that is punk. You just go and and you live with it yeah i think yuri really missed an opportunity to be an actor because he was so good and he really is so good still yeah like we had we we did this promo i I shouldn't describe it in case we use it because it's too good but we did a promo for a a tour that got obviously just never got uh, announced right when 2020 pandemic was happening so we kept it away but i shot that thing one take and he nailed it and it is the funniest thing i've ever seen and someday we'll even if we don't do the tour we'll release it but we technically could still do a tour like that so it would work but so i want to keep it but uh my god i was just thinking like this guy is just pure comedy gold like everything he does is hilarious and he laughs at his own jokes too so (laughs) but (laughs) but he's the best dude he's so good it's crazy. I mean, what is, I mean, I'm curious now, like, okay, so, well, I mean, you've built, I wanted to ask you, like, now it's been how many years? I guess, I mean, it's poking at you. It was, it was how many years ago? Uh, well, 20, well, 1994. So, okay. Uh, over Whatever 20, that means. Yeah. It's, it's not um, 30, but it's, it's 27, 28. I'm probably wrong on that math, but how how do you see like the band as an as as an entity now, like as a brand? Like what is what is MXPX now to you? Like how like how do you see it? Uh that's an interesting one. Uh <laughs> I, I my first thought when you started mentioning that was I try not to see it. <laughs> I try not to overthink it in some ways. In other ways, I really do kind of overthink it, I think. But um, right now in 2022, I think of MXPX as 
an escape, an escape hatch for people that want to either escape back to their old life or, well, that's actually not truly what I think. I mean, I, I think that's okay, but sure. I'm really trying. There's memory. I mean, there's, memories. there's memories involved. Yes. And that's cool. But I really want people to, for right now, to, for us to be an escape right now. So if like, if you like punk rock, you like skate punk or pop punk or anything in that genre to listen to us, you're going to have, you're going to get something out of it. You're going to be uplifted or you're going to feel like maybe I can do things better in my life. Um, with that, but, but at the same time, realizing failures are an everyday part of life too. So I think, um, MXPX is to me is, is a way to help people. And on a very superficial level, like I'm not necessarily out there like yeah, walking sure. people across the street with my music, but yeah. um, on a very chill level, like music can do a lot for you, right? It can help you with solidarity when you're sad and it can help you, you know, work out harder when you're working out, you know, and you're just, just wanna, whatever yeah. it is, right? So I feel like music for that, for, for us is is an escape for people. So like I've tr I try really hard not to put my own weird spin on yeah. things. And, and I do put my own spin on things, of course. But what I mean is like, I'm a negative person at times, but I try not to put that into the songs in a way that's going to make people go, ah, that makes me feel bad. So it, it's a weird dichotomy because a lot of what I've written, you know, over my life has been, about negative feelings, about this struggle, this problem, this disconnect in my relationship with this person or whatever. Right. But what I mean is like you can have you can have those subject matters, but but always try to figure out where to go from there. Yeah. So I think the MXPX has really kind of just been on that arc for a long time, but it just it changes. Do you love like the merch? and all the fun stuff that you get, to, like the collector aspect. I, mean, I know you love all that stuff. So to be able to do it with your own band and to see pressings and stickers or shirts, I mean, do you get pretty pumped on that stuff? I, you know, it's always been about the collection of a few, of, a, of like a, um, like a CD collection. That's where it was, like it started out in my career, CDs were a thing. And so we had cassettes, we had CDs, and I loved seeing my CDs on a shelf. You know what I mean? Just yeah. like that is what I love. And so I did that with, you know, all records. I, I would, I, would, I had like every single all tape on cassette that that existed. Um, and then CDs all, totally just all, eradicated all, that. Okay, hold on. Do you think all, wait, the band all? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you think the album Pummel is a perfect album? Almost. Ooh. <laughs> I'd say there's a couple album tracks on it, but besides that, it is. Vita Blue, not my favorite. It's so funny okay. that I have a, I have like a song that I just called yeah. out. Like, <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean it's just like I was like, yeah, I don't know. I don't like that song, but it's not a bad song. Like I don't even think you can find that I don't think you can find that album on Spotify. I don't think you can find it digitally anywhere. It was it was in that weird like crater of when things were dropping off physically and then yeah it wasn't did the digital streaming market wasn't intact quite yet right. and so a lot, I can get <clears throat> there's so many things that i could yeah we could talk about like so many bands including mxpx <laughs> we didn't even know about streaming until like 2018 you know and so we we're pretty late in the game as far as that kind of stuff goes really yeah so oh. you're sitting here praising me for like knowing everything, like knowing what's going on. And <laughs> honestly, we just were just trying to write songs and play, and you know, well, you we got lucky. Podcasting before it was cool, though. I mean, you but like that's I mean, but that's that's I mean when 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 I saw you at a podcast, I was like, oh no, there he goes. Like this is rad. I was like, wait, like to me, that's like to me, podcasting is like again, it's back to that punk rock. You get to make an album every time you turn the mic on, you get the camera on, you're ready to go. You got your intro, you got your out. Like to me, like I see that creative process and I go, oh, that's one more outlet, you know? Absolutely. I mean, for me, podcasting, it was 2013 when I started it. And it was, oh. it was before, I know, forever ago. Oh, dude. 
it, it was before streaming was on my radar. Like, absolutely. Like, I was doing the podcast, and MXPX was just starting to make our our swing back up. Like, we had those years from 2007 to 2013 that were, like, pretty low, where we didn't play as much. Still a band, but just not doing much. Yuri, Tom and Yuri were very busy with family stuff. Yuri had some kids at the, yep. that point. But anyway, uh, we started moving back up, discovered streaming. We're like, oh, maybe it's a thing. I don't know. We'll see. You, you know, it's like you don't really know because you're not making money off it. And then once right. you realize, oh, if you own your own music and then do streaming, then you'll make literally twice as much, maybe even more than twice as much. So it's just like these weird things. Of course, you know, it's like there's a there's a balance because record labels and the, the, the mainstream industry part of the music business can push you up, spend sure. dollars, invest dollars on, on an act, on a brand, whatever it is, and make you well known to the world. And then then it's time to go. It's kind of like a revolving door, like with politicians, where they do all the favors for these corporations while they're in office. And then they get hired by that corporation. So like we kind of did it where we got all these endorsements by these labels, figured out, oh, okay, we can make a lot more money if we just go out on our own. And then we did that. So that's what we've been doing. But they're scared, but they're scared. I mean, I'm I'm on the brand side of it now with a whole different business. And I, you know, and when I am near anything music industry, I'm in those rooms and they're scared to death. I mean, they like the game plan is, can you please tell the artist to start communicating on TikTok? Like that's it. That's that's their idea. <laughs> no, it's not their idea. It's the reality. It's the reality. Meaning, <laughs> they, meaning they have nothing more to bring to the table. Right. They don't know how to f they, find the audience anymore. Yeah. They, and you and so like watching those conversations go down and 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 just the last even the last six months. Some labels have reached out dude. everyone's in, you know, everyone's just scared to death because the, the, the gatekeepers never really go away. But, but, but for as much as you could have the gatekeepers dead, it's pretty, they're pretty dead right now. Like it's, and the gatekeepers are trying to figure out how to get control of all that. But when you move at the speed of thought, you know, when you move at the speed of creativity, as Robert Rodriguez says about when digital cameras came out, you could you could mm. create at the speed of thought. When you can communicate at the speed of thought, that same what what, what I'm so fascinated now is watching bands say VFW hall, then let's get in the van and we'll drive. Another VFW hall, get in the van and drive. Now when an artist says, I'm gonna communicate right now on social media. And then 30 minutes later, I have an idea. Then an hour later, I have an idea. An hour later, I might go in and do a duet. And I might jump on that. And then I might go live. It's like, okay, well, only 50 people showed up. And I'm thinking, yeah, but that was that was always the recipe. Like, you're telling me mm -hmm. MXPX never played a show for 50 people. Or when you did play a show for 50 people, you were like, 50 people just showed up. Right. And when you came back around, they brought two friends each. And I'm watching that happen now on this format. And I think people really are, are, they really are still misunderstanding what the heck is happening. The punk rock DIY blueprint that every band knows, but they know it in a very elongated way because that time in the van sucks. It's hard. It's difficult just to get to go play one show for 20 minutes but that hustle, if you could invert that hustle now and put it right here, like what you guys did during the pandemic, but if that becomes not, as opposed to that being the exception, but if you make it the norm, that is the new hustle. Yeah. That is the new hustle. And it's so punk rock because the only person that wins is the person that communicates the most or plays the most shows. That's pretty rad. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's hard to say because it's funny because when I look at, when I think back and I think three years ago, five years ago, I would, this is what we, where we are right now. Let's, let's just put it simple, numbers. 
data, you know, sales, numbers, whatever, people listening to our stuff, it's so much more than it was five years ago. And so, like, we're always moving up, yet you never feel like satisfied in a lot of ways. You, like, never feel like, okay, I can stop working now. You know, not that I'm not satisfied with life. I mean, I love life, but right. but sure. you just never feel like if you could if you could go, okay, all right, t- five years from now, if you made twice as much as you do right now, are you good with that? We can just call it a day. Most people be like, right. yeah, that that'd be amazing. That'd be awesome. But of course, you know, everything else while you're doing your work is going up. Things are changing. You know, the balances are being unbalanced, but. Tell me if I'm wrong, or at least in your opinion, uh, you were talking about gatekeepers and how right now, maybe the last 10 years even, they've been like the lowest they have because of the not them not knowing where to go, how to figure out their business. Right. I feel like that, like you're saying, they're trying to figure out how to get control back. I feel like that's happening right now. It's been happening uh as we're coming out of this pandemic stuff, um, as big big changes are happening in the big corporations, big entertainment industries, um, I feel like it's going to get harder again for independent artists doing what they do. And we, we might have to change it. Well, we're definitely going to have to change our game again. Um, and in some ways might have to partner with some of these big, big brands just to like stay above until we can find oh there's an island over there let's start paddling that way right well i mean like i said i i definitely understand that but again i mean i don't uh, let's find that question really that question only has one subject noun in it which is even a noun is cash flow that's it that that idea assumes cash flow. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. That, right. So depending on how you want cash flow, no matter what you're doing, mm. do you want to build a house? Do you want to flip it with your own money? Do you want to borrow? Do you want to partner? These are all. So when you need money, money is the only place where you really run into gatekeepers. Mm-hmm. Like that's one thing I've come to try to understand. And so, when you partner with people, a lot of pressure comes at, are you making them a profit? You know, mm-hmm. do they get to tell you now who gets to come on tour with you. Do they, and, and the punkest of punk people I know, what we actually want is just, just don't you dare tell me what to do. I don't even care what you're paying me, but don't tell me what to do. Don't, don't tell me you showed the album cover to your mom and she didn't like it. <laughs> or didn't get like, yeah yeah don't so, don't bring that to the conversation so cash flow it, they always tell you or they i didn't go to college either so i'm kind of grasping in the dark crawling in the yeah. dark um but when it comes to finance you're always taught don't use your own money right. get a loan get somebody else to pay for it but of right. course, what they don't tell you is now those people own part of what you're doing, you know? Yeah. So it's like, so we've always, yeah. as a, as a, you know, in the last 10 years, we've been very DIY and we've always been anti corporate hands in the jar. Um, yeah. But I just wonder why is it that everybody tells you to use other people's money? If you have, even if, if you have your own money, they even say, just keep that money or whatever, just. Don't use your own money. So I wonder why that, what's the logic there? Do you, the logic is, is that, and this is the great thing about rich, wealthy people, rich, wealthy people who have been successful. They're not afraid to lose. And so they, so they, when, when, when they lose, it doesn't feel like when we lose. So it's nice when you meet really wealthy people who want to invest in things. They're like, Oh, I'll take a flyer for 250 grand. You're like, Whoa. Like, and, but, but all investments come from people that have made money. The wealthiest people, the richest people, dude, those people are losing money all day long. Like it's rad. Like I love, I love those dudes, you know, um, cause they really are 
because they're gutsy. They're like, they're the ones and we kind of make fun of them and people, oh, rich people. Dude, it's rich people funding every stupid idea that some entrepreneur has that they've convinced to like write a check for. So God bless these guys. You just, you, you just, you just got to love that. But like me, I'm, I made a bunch of films in a row made a ton of money. And then I made a bunch of films in a row, lost millions for people. I thought I was like, ah, investments you make. And I, first I was rolling, making people money. This is great. You know, like I would, I would have told you, you know, Hey, we lose money. They're all big boys. They know they, they get it, whatever, you know, um, as soon as I started losing money for people, I couldn't, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't stomach it. Mm. Even if they could, I was like, I'm never, ever, I, I realized I wasn't cut out for losing people money. And right. I figured that out for me. I was like, Oh, never again. That like, makes you a good person. I think. <laughs> well, I mean, look, I mean, there, but there, look, but there are some people who are just savages and they get it. And they, and they're 10, you know, the, guy that started uber i mean you know forget one of his partners the, the amount of the, the project before that they lost so much money for so and he says i just still can't shake it. i still can't shake you know that we lost that money for those people and you know so some people have that other people they can lose it all day long but they build relationships with those people and then project five or six makes money and it maybe recoups all that whatever you know but I, I love though. Again, I think maybe that's part of the self awareness everyone talks about. Are you self aware? I, once I realize I can't do that anymore, I just spend my own money. I like doing that. Um, I have bands reach out, you know, to this day, like let's do it. You know, how much for a music video? I don't even charge bands for music videos anymore. Like I can't even stomach. <laughs> I'm gonna bleep this part out. <laughs> no, but like, no, I gotta get to you somehow, or they gotta get to me in Idaho. But like, no, dude, I would like. I can't even, because I know what it's like for a band, like, and the idea now that some band is going to spend, like, if, if I really wanted to charge for a music video, like people are like, you got to be insane. So I don't even do that, which by the way, we got to either, I got to get out to you guys. I don't know. Wait, like we, we have to do, like, we're doing some music videos. Like I'm forcing myself on you. I'm coming out. I know you guys are all self-contained and super talented, but I'm coming out. I'm selfish. I want another MXPX video. I was going to mention so, this after the um, show, but yes, we'll yeah, just, let's do it. <laughs> let's do this. Um, and no, because it's, you know, there's nothing, it, it's sort of like, what does it take for you to walk into a recording studio and just sing? It's what you do. Sure, sure. Right? But I ain't doing it for free. <laughs> yeah, well, but, but that's the no, thing, but right? I would, like. For some people, I would, it, it I guess. It depends where it is. It depends where it is. What do you want to mm -hmm. do? You know, if there's some local band that's like, and you like them, and they say, hey, guest on this on this track, you're going to jump in. And it's... Yep, absolutely. And so I, I, I have found other ways to kind of make money and make really good money and do all that stuff. And I, and for me, it's like, I, all, I don't know, maybe you can relate to this. I don't know. But to me, my filmmaking was always just my sketchbook. It was a sketchbook. I, I, I just, I draw, I, I, I just draw with, and for so long it was, film was expensive and you're renting cameras. The gatekeepers just to get to my craft costed me thousands. Once it was digital and it was me and a camera and I could do everything, I felt for the first time like I was in a band. So it was a like, good thing for you that things went oh. digital because a lot of professional video, you know, filmmakers, video makers, photographers obviously lost big money, big careers. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I was right there. Um, I think my career, like at the height of like when we're spending half a million dollars on blink videos and all of that stuff, like right, right around there, like I crashed the kind of industry crashes. I'm going through personal crisis life who am i you know and like just all that and then you know and then i kind of start over and then digital shows up and i'm taking you know and like i was doing thousand dollar and two thousand dollar music videos and my wife and i are traveling you know hotwire.com shows up and we can get cheap flights and go somewhere and make a music video we're doing like every time i die videos in buffalo and we can go out there and get a hotel room and come back on a $2,000 budget and maybe make 500 bucks. But I could do that 
four or five times a month, I was okay. When digital came out, and I my, the, the camera house called me and said, Darren, we're looking at a digital camera here. It shoots 24 frames. It looks like, I was like, shut up. And I drove down. LA traffic drove down. They set the camera up. They had a monitor. I couldn't believe the way it looked. So I went, I put a chair in front of the, the, the camera. And I act like I was playing the drums. I wanted to see movement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to go shoot a music video right there. So I'm doing this. I'm jumping. I'm like, okay. I say, now take that footage, dump it to VHS. I have to, I'm watching an HD monitor, which was new. I'm going to take it home and see what it looks like on VHS on my TV. It was the equivalent of doing the mix down in your car, right? Yeah, like, yeah. I, I had to go see it. Brought it home. I pressed play. I sat there looking at that thing over, and I couldn't believe the world had just changed. Literally six months later, Mac comes out with the new iMac with the ball on the bottom, movable screen, and it's got iMovie in it. And then a week later... Final Cut comes out, and one of my DP, well, he was kind of an intern and went on to do really, really amazing things as a director himself. I remember he said to me, because he learned the digital camera, then after a couple of videos, I looked at him and I said, I think I can learn this camera. I'm, I'm, I'm going to learn it. You know, I'm not going to need you. There goes his and job. And he was, <laughs> was his job, right? And it was great. And then he said to me, like a week later, he calls me, he goes, we live in the same town. He goes, Darren, I think we can edit on the computer everything. I said, shut up. He goes, dude, I'll buy, I'll buy a Mac right now. I'll get the software. Instead of 500 bucks an hour, I'll charge you 200 and I'm in your backyard. I was like, what? Sure. So we did that and we were doing it. And then of course I looked at him like a month later, like, you know, I'm going to buy, I'm going to buy a Mac. I'm going to buy yeah, a Mac, you like... know? <laughs> uh, but at that point he was now able to direct because he bought the camera. He had it. And then he went on to do great things. But at that moment on a two, $3,000 music video, I, I had like a 20% markup. So I might make 500, 600 bucks, right? Overnight. I have an 80% markup. Like that, like my wife and I, six months later buy a condo like i'm putting you know 1200 1400 to I, it's just like that was for me i could and i could be more creative i could edit whenever i wanted i didn't have to go at midnight to the like i wasn't getting film wasn't developing i shoot come home and i would just start editing and i could edit all night my edits were now better i didn't have the pressure so i think all i think all that when you see your own personal gatekeepers, it's not always just people, but it's technology and what keeps you from doing things. I love, you know, but let me just jump real quick. You said, well, what's the future? Do we partner? Do we do corporate stuff? I think the future now is like, I'll, I'll give you a great example. Um, oh, and I've got to say my friend Luke Pearson's name because he's the biggest, he, he flipped out. So I'm just saying his name cause he, he wanted to hear his name on the podcast. Anyways, <laughs> Luke Pearson, um, but I think what's going to happen now is, is since all companies now know that they need to be branding, you, it's so much easier to find alignment with people that you're into, you know? So I think now the, the future is going to be, um, like, I know a great company called Mission Meats. Mission Meats makes the best beef jerky meat sticks you've ever had. It's all like grass fed, grass finished. I didn't even know grass finished was a thing, but it's, mm -hmm. you know, there's no nitrates, no nothing. It is literally the best tasting beef jerky I've ever had in my entire life. Those dudes, they're building their brand and they're going to, they would partner up with a band like you and say, Oh yeah, we'll, we'll sponsor a tour. And it's not going to be talking to an agent or an in-between person. You're going to talk to the owner and the owner's going to go, what do you want? 10 grand, 20 grand. And then you're going to say, yeah, but we need a hundred grand. Okay. Well, let's get my friends. Uh, he does really cool leather wallets. Oh, that's it. So all of a sudden you got all these things that align. Like it doesn't feel like you're selling out. You're on the road. It's meat sticks. Of course. That's great. You want to, you want to eat healthy is nothing worse than eating crap on the road and hating yourself, you know, and trying to have energy. And so maybe then a coffee company. So all of these, so the, the ability to be aligned now 
with so many without feeling like you're selling out to me that's that's the dawn of this new age of collaborations again back to being punk rock you do that you know you do that two-sided whatever we call that back in the day right you know yeah. <laughs> whatever that was yeah, yeah, yeah. right yeah split pressing right split testing yeah. and you split all the costs right so the so to me this is still punk rock but now you're able to meet so many more people. And again, now you're meeting people who are starting businesses who are probably fans of your music, who grew up on your music. And so to me, that's gonna be the best way. That's what I see happening right now. I see these companies that know that just doing your Facebook ads or doing your whatever, like that's all the iOS 15 thing was a whole, that's a whole other conversation, how it shut down information, what you can track, what you can't track everything's dead now the only thing winning is creative that's it the best so idea you, the best idea so the last five or six years it's just been a land rush because the the algorithm and the reach was organic and it's free and you can just and a lot of people took advantage of that that's what you're supposed to do um houses in waco are more expensive now than they were five years ago it's just <laughs> yeah. the way it goes right but now what's happened is enough people have gotten in and now the cream is going to rise and that's creative and so it's funny you go back to talking about yuri you go back to what you guys did during the pandemic you guys knowing just how great you guys are i think a, i think a band like i think a band like mxpx is if you just understand that it's just punk rock inverted on steroids now no one's going to outwork you that's the one thing. No one's going to outwork a band like MXPX because you already have the work ethic. Right. So to me, I see so many crazy opportunities that it gets me so excited. So I, I still love reaching out, connecting with people, especially when we get a little bit older. We understand business. We understand these things. And now we get a little more strategic. Yeah. You know, it's funny. And now like we're Thinking back to the very beginning of like when we started working together, um, that's kind of what was always true about punk rock is collaborating yeah. with people, um, just coming up with good ideas and just making it ha and having fun. You know, thinking about we didn't talk about teenage politics yet, but that was on the first trip. Uh, <laughs> after, I think that was it the same the same trip as t punk rock show or was that like months later? Because we did. I think uh, it was. I think it was months later. Months later. So teenage politics and money tree we did together, kinda maybe. Yes. Uh, yep. Yeah. Around the same week. Yep. Teenage yep. politics. I just remember being yep. so much fun. Um, just finding like, it was like a a fan or a friend of somebody's. You know, it was like, hey, I got a house. Shoot a video there or whatever. I don't even remember. I don't know if you you remember, but. Just the whole idea no, of just bringing all these people. I, I just remember that. That's. I just remember. I think you're wearing my Letterman's jacket. Yes, I am. Is that your jacket? That's my jacket. Yeah. <laughs> like that's what. Like I remember. Like I was like, and I remember. Like again, someone just said, "What if it was one?" Like, I don't even know. I don't know how it happened. Someone just said, "What if it's one shot?" We're moving through a party again. Yuri again walking in the door. You know, not again. That was pre. You know, chick magnet, mm -hmm. Yuri coming in, you know, and I just, I remember the chess scene. I remember when you did the hands and I remember, I, I don't, it's, I still lose it to this day when you, when you <laughs> motion at, me at the chest, like it's just, it looks so like, weird. I don't, think people, I don't think people understand, like we're literally a bunch of kids that people gave money to, to make stuff. Yeah. It's wild. Like, and we're, and we did. And then again, back to. I, I was at Epitaph Records like a week after, and they'd been hearing from Fletcher about this MXPX band. And I had just picked up the raw, the, the developed footage for Teenage Politics, stopped by Epitaph. I had a VHS copy, and Brett Gerwitz and a few people were like, Who's this band? And I said, Well, I just shot some stuff, and I popped the tape in. And the footage that was first on there was all the slow motion footage from the performance with everyone in the pit in the dirt. Like, it's it's funny to think about that video, because remember, even the, Dan Snow goes running out behind. It's a Pennywise shirt. We're on the it's a Pennywise hoodie that we're following out. Again, another little like 
nod to what was going on. Mm -hmm. Um, But that pit was gnarly, dude, in the dirt and people. And I remember watching everyone at Epitaph going, I mean, you, you could hear, not like it was like diabolical, but you could hear them saying, how do we not know? (laughs) <laughs> that's the thing Who is, how is yeah. there a punk band somewhere in the desert it looks like and there's a mosh pit going on with like hundreds of kids how do we not know like you could i mean i'm reading into it a little too much but you could but you could get that sense of like i get i and i just loved it i just loved that that was like again to me it was like the punk rockers were being out punk rocked you had your your finger on the pulse of punk rock more than the 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 guard. <laughs> I I mean, I think so. But again, I got lucky because I'm sure, as you would say, as a band, you you really do put yourself there. You go on tour, you meet other bands, you go do stuff. I mean, I, I remember the first time someone said, "You got to do a video for AFI," and I went and I saw them play, and all I heard was I heard this high pitched. I was like, "Oh, this band sucks!" You're like. That guy just screamed like Mickey Mouse. Like I didn't couldn't I couldn't even like understand him. Then they sent me the album. I think it was asking for it. And again, once I heard it, I was like, oh wow. Like this is. And then I connected how wild he was as a front man and how strong mm. Davey. And I was like, oh man. And then same thing. I, I I meet with them and they say, we just want to do a takeoff of Goodfellas. That was the idea. Hey, I just want to get stabbed a bunch of times, and I want to be bloody. I want to be in the back of a car like Goodfellas, and then we'll just do a performance at the Berkeley whatever square. I forget if it was Berkeley Square or something else. But sounds right. Um, yeah. And that, like, those were our ideas, right? Now I loved filmmaking, so it was fun. Whenever we, and I, I think the only area where I sort of, well, one, there was no one making music videos but me. There was Lewis Poson at Hopeless Records, but he pretty much went blind, so he couldn't make music videos, you know. Um, I was the I was the only guy. Like, when you're the only band, they have to book you. Right, yeah, I mean, that's true. Like, I was the only kid saying, like, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll make that music video, and that got me every single crazy opportunity. But I think because I loved... A lot of people, again, it kind of goes back to almost what I was saying about when I heard life in general. There was something more going on there that, at least as a fan, I was like, oh, these guys know a little bit more about music than I think we know. And for me, I think that was my music videos. They weren't really, they were punk rock, but there was, but they were still very, I still took it seriously as a filmmaker. Yeah, like I didn't just point the camera and hope something like I was composing and you know I'm trying to be David Fincher or I'm trying to like now they never translated but my bar was so high it it created something other than just running around with a camera um, and that was the sense I got again right at life in general and moving forward it was like. Because once you guys got like sonic, like like there was more sonic, like soundscapey type stuff, like like almost like scoring and picking pattern type of stuff. I was just like, oh man, like these guys could be scoring movies. Like it just it was it was all kind of coming together. But yeah, the Buffalo, it's just like it's all like, oh, like I loved watching again, it was that. It was that thing that you could be punk rock, but at the same time, it was still super intentional. That's kind of how I think about the work I always wanted to mm-hmm. do. But that's how I think about a band like MXPX. Like, yeah, it's punk, but it knows exactly what it's doing. There's no, there's a point where there's no more accidents. Yeah, I went back and watched the the videos you made for us, and the thing I noticed is the theme throughout is there's interesting moments that happen. That may have been planned. Some may have some just captured, you know, in the performance part of it. But you put those things in the right spots, and it's like now me thinking back, like the, like the the chest shot or whatever you talk about, the chest shot. Uh, <laughs> you know, just like it's just weird, but it, like because you put that in there at that time, like some directors might not have added that shot because the 
the person looks like a weirdo. Like, <laughs> but that's exactly what makes right. it interesting, kind of, right. right? Right. Yeah. Well, and, th- and that's loving film. I mean, that's loving films. That's loving, mm-hmm. you know, everything from, you know, some gnarly, you know, classic, you know, western to to a Napoleon Dynamite. You know, I mean, in a lot of ways, we were doing that before. Nap- I mean, like, not that we were doing that, but it's in that same vein of humor and doing things and not being afraid of just, we think it's funny, so we're going to do it. Sure. I don't want to take too much of your time, but I do want to ask, like, what's your favorite, Good. what's your favorite movie that you've worked on? In- Mo- uh, movies for me, my, I don't know if movies for me are kind of like tours for you. I mean, they just hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay. Movies for me, I think was just always more of a a, a creative struggle. Again, I did this um I did this documentary called Collision um with Douglas Wilson and Christopher Hitchens and Christopher is like at that time the greatest living atheist. He was just brutal. I mean, he was, you know, in Doug, Doug Wilson was this podunk kind of Johnny Cash pastor up in North Idaho, up, up here, actually. And they had written an exchange, and I had read it, and they both were sort of throwing each other off. Like, it was it was like a band. I was like, ooh, and I just reached out and said, hey, would you guys, could I put you guys on tour for three, four days debating, but I'll document the whole process before, after, hanging out, not, not just the debates, and doing that for me was, and then the finished product, the soundtrack is hip hop and it's metal and it's progressive rock and it's punk. And it, and, and the idea that I took something like, you know, a debate on faith and the existence of God, but made it the most punk rock like thing ever. To me, it's still probably one of my favorite projects only because and maybe you can relate. There's there's some things you create that you feel like you're keeping up with it. Mm. It's going, it's good. You, you don't really know how it got that good, but you're you're gonna you're gonna help it along the way. So when it's done, it there's not all the usual insecurities. Um, when that project was done, first of all, it felt like it was my middle finger, not like I was flipping, but it was just my internal Johnny Cash middle finger. Like I'm going to make the movie I want to make. Um, and that was, it was, and on a subject that I really like on a subject that I think is very watered down, people debate the existence of God. Everyone's so polite. I wanted a UFC event. I wanted no opening statement, for 10 minutes and a follow-up statement for 10 minutes. I wanted pure cross-examination. Let's fight. Yeah. You know, and that probably for me is still just one of my favorite projects. It just, because it was, you know, I was scared the whole time because I knew I was, like you said, I've been way too deep. I put myself creatively way too deep, but it just felt really, really good. So, you know, for, for me, that was just a really, you know, I just, I really enjoy that. And I've tried to take that in even the last few years, really extract what it is I liked about doing that and just making things, you know? And so now, and again, now I can sit and edit something and I can pull up Soundstripe or Artlist or Extreme Music. And I can be, you know, before you used to look at your CD collection, you get temp music for stuff, you know, you could never use. And that the fact I can create in real time now, yeah, I just finished a new television series for um, Outside TV. And I'm sitting here, I'm editing the episodes, but I, I edit in real time. I'm grabbing a piece of music. I'm trying this. Wait, what if I did that? instead? You couldn't. I love that because I know that even 10 years ago, you couldn't do that. And so to be able to create with all these amazing people now that have their work out there, even B-roll. Now I can get, I don't got to go to New York. I can, there's a thousand places that'll get me an amazing exterior shot of New York better than I could go shoot. Right. I mean, so that I love, I love being able to create at the speed of thought. And so that's just, you know, that's, that's my favorite thing. And, uh, and then performance videos, as much as I love 
narrative's hard. Being funny is hard. It's just a lot of work. I'll do it. I love it. But I know how I feel at the end of the day. When I shoot a band and it's a performance video, it's the only place I'm cocky. Like the only place you'll even get me close to being cocky from an, an art standpoint is the performance video. Because I think I'm the only human that deserves to be in a room when a band is performing. I believe most people there are shooting the band. When I'm in a room with the band, I'm a part of the band. And it just, it, there's just something different. I love, I still love the performance video, but the way I do it, it's just that there is something different because I want to be at the stage looking up at the band. So all my shots, majority of, you know, there's a superhero because that was the best spot at the stage looking up mm. and you see the sweat coming down. Like I'm always trying to capture that true melt your face like that. Bad. I want the performance video to be the closest thing for someone who might not ever get to a live show to say, man, I experienced the band. And for the band to say that's as good of an extension as it's going to be without seeing us live. Like that's, that's what I love. Right. I love that too. So that's what we're, that's what we're going to do. So you, you, you better send me some music real soon. <laughs> well, let's do it. All right. We're working on some always, always. Good, good. Well, dude, we could talk for hours and hours and hours. I, I'd love to have you back. You know, we can talk more about like, specific vlogging things, lighting things, like things yeah. that I yeah. personally want to know from you. Yes, but, uh, let's do it. This was fun. This was really fun. I'll I'll come out there and bring the family um, out there. And, you know, we have to do another trip out that, that way. I mean, because you're in. Is that where you're at now? I mean, are you are you Washington ever? Are you, are you Texas, Texas now? Wa no, Washington too. Yeah, I'll, I'll be back in okay. Washington soon, actually. So uh, all I'm summer. here. Yeah, let's okay, do it. Okay, well, we're five hours away from each other or a one-hour flight, so it's super easy. So we're definitely going to hang out. Absolutely. Let's do it. Let's do it. And, and um, obviously, uh, you are so good at what you do. I love what you do. Where can people find you? Um, I mean, mainly – I mean, actually, I finally got a website up and running again, which is, I think, just donnetwork.com, but really just social media – Instagram, Doan Creative, or just look up Darren Doan. Um, but the secret spot, and we'll talk about this in another podcast, the secret spot is go find me on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the most underrated platform on the planet right now. I'm on LinkedIn. <laughs> I feel so Good. weird being on LinkedIn because I'm like, no, everybody's so corporate. You know, and... it's almost, you know, it's almost a billion people on LinkedIn. That's a lot of people. Don't I mean, Twitter's 500 million. Think about that for a moment. Wow. I mean, don't, that's another podcast, but that's like, I know with one last weird punk rock story that I think <laughs> okay. adds point to here, which is I'll never forget Fletcher from Pennywise saying they would tour with no effects. They'd get the Pacific Northwest and then no effects would say, Hey, take three days off and then we'll meet back to continue the tour. And they'd always be like, Oh, Okay. Two or three tours in, they're you know they're doing the same thing. And Fletcher's like, "What do you guys do during those three days?" And Fat Mike was like, "Yeah, you know, we just..." Uh, and finally, Fletcher's like, "We're going. Whatever you're doing, we're going with you." He's like, "Ah, all right." They were going to Canada. Canada. Yeah. Nobody went to Canada. Only No Effects went to Canada, and they weren't going to tell anybody. That they went from like a 300 person show in Seattle to like 2,000 in Canada. Yeah, yeah, that is so funny. Right. And so to me, LinkedIn is the Canada. Yes. You gotta get there to promote anything that you're doing from a business standpoint. So, all right, that's it. Mike, I love you, man. Love you too, Darren. Thanks for doing it. Appreciate it. Talk you're to the you, best. Bro. Thank you. Bye, everybody.